Hello and welcome to Quadriga, where the focus is on Turkey as President Erdogan seeks to consolidate power following a failed coup. Consolidate power by declaring a state of emergency to enable, quote, the removal of all elements of terrorist organizations that were involved in the coup. The coup itself began last Friday when tanks rolled through Istanbul and military jets streaked through the sky above Ankara. The uprising was quickly halted when thousands of Erdogan's supporters followed his call and took to the streets. But was this truly, as the president claimed, a victory for democracy? He has moved quickly to execute what he terms essential cleansing, ordering the arrest of thousands, purging the military, judiciary and academia. Our question on this edition of Quadriga, Turkey coup, blank check for Erdogan? And to answer that question, we've invited three guests who are following events in Turkey very closely. It's a pleasure to welcome Seda Serda. She's head of DW's Turkish News Service, and she says Erdogan doesn't need anyone to give him a blank check. He is doing what he wants. And it's a great pleasure to welcome back to the program Alan Posner. He is a British-German commentator at the Berlin Daily newspaper Die Welt. He says nobody's about to give Erdogan a blank check, but demonizing him will help neither Turkey nor the West. And great to have Antje Bauer with us. She is a freelance journalist who in the past has reported on the Middle East, Turkey and Afghanistan and is now working with the Deutsche Welle Academy, offering workshops for journalists in the Arab world. And she says, Turkey has a new national hero, Mr. Erdogan. And he is as much an image of his time as his predecessor, Mr. Kemal Atatürk, was for his own. So, um, Seda Seda, if this is indeed a blank check, it looks as if President Erdogan must have filled it out quite some time ago. The lists of journalists, officers, academicians to be purged are so detailed and so long, they surely couldn't have been compiled just in this past week. I also agree it could not have been compiled in the last few weeks, uh, just the uh, last few days actually. But we have to understand that um, Erdogan was already looking into uh, the Gulen movement and how it was affecting Turkey and, if how, and how it was affecting his uh, government. So with this um, failed coup, this was actually for him, perfect timing to go after um, all the people that he believes are affiliated with the Gulen movement. But we have to really be careful here and because it has been, um, pe many people have been gathered very quickly. So we really need to know if these people, all of them are really connected with this coup or how are they connected with this coup? And I think time is going to tell us. It's a little bit suspicious, I find. Okay, let's come back in just a minute uh, to who may or may not have been behind the coup. But Antje Bauer, staying with the current situation and reactions to that, as the coup was unfolding, there was actually an astonishing degree of unanimity between supporters of the AKP, of Erdogan's party, opposition members of parliament, even the country's cultural and intellectual elite saying, we need to preserve democracy, we need to defeat this coup. What is the situation now among those who are not direct supporters of Erdogan's party? I think the interesting thing about this was that when the coup happened, people, there was a certain unanimity, not of everybody, obviously there was a minority who was with the military, but we know, don't know how many there were. But there was a large, large uh, unanimity about uh, preserving um, uh, a sort of democratic system, even if I, I doubt to, to, to talk about democracy, talking about today's Turkey. But uh, Turkey has lived through four coups already, three official ones and one hidden one. And uh, they know that nothing good comes out of coups, military coups. But uh, the situation after this, uh, when the coup failed, is uh, that I think we see that the polar uh, polarization which existed in the Turkish population before this is getting stronger and stronger now. And I would say that after this military coup attempt which failed, there was a second coup which is being uh, implemented right now and which is working. And uh, obviously there's a part of the population which does not agree with this. And in fact, there's an atmosphere of, of fear and uh, people are, are frightened. Many people are thinking about leaving the country. 
because of the actual situation. Is that something that you also hear from contacts that you have in Turkey, Sira Sira, that people are afraid uh, and wonder perhaps whether they may be next on these lists? Well, some people are, of course, afraid. They don't know what to expect. However, um, recently the president said that this will not affect fundamental rights. Um, we have to wait and see if that is the case. But we know now with this um, um, state of emergency, there's going to be a lot of restrictions. So restriction of travel, so people who are even thinking about traveling might not be able to. There's going to be searches on the streets, they're going to ask your IDs. So it's going to be a different, um, different Turkey. But we have to wait and see a little bit. Alan Posner, um there were a lot of calls from powers outside Turkey, of course, also as the coup was unfolding to preserve what they referred to as democracy in Turkey. But the fact is, and has, hasn't democracy been disappearing for quite some time? There, I've heard some critical voices saying actually Erdogan was already in the midst of carrying out his own creeping coup. Well, you have to look where these voices are coming from. I, I mean, just to say that democracy hasn't been there in Turkey for some years is, um, in a way, assuming that before Erdogan, let's face it, there was a democracy, and there wasn't. Um, the fact is that the deep state existed, the generals existed, that Kemalism means if Turkey goes in a direction which we don't like, we the generals don't like, we'll stage a coup. And they have done this repeatedly. And the fact is that Kemalism means a sort of a, a laicistic a non-religious general's caste ruling over a Muslim population. That was unsustainable. Erdogan did away with that. And therefore, the, most people, most observers felt that Turkey was moving under Erdogan towards democracy, not away from it. Of course, the military, of course, the Kemalists were screaming, you know, oh, it's the end of democracy. No, it was the end of the deep state. It was the end of the ability of the generals to stage a coup whenever they felt that you know, things weren't moving as they wanted. And that was a good thing. The question now is, um, will the old Kemalist deep state be replaced by an AK party deep state? I'm not, you know, I, I think we need to wait and see, but that would be a terrible thing. Let's just remind our audience of what Kemalism is all about. It's a reference, of course, to the secularist republic that was established by Kemal Ataturk almost a century ago. And indeed, the military has seen itself as a pillar of that order. This time, however, its coup failed. As Alan mentioned, there have been uh, previous coups that did succeed. This one failed. The question is, do the events of this past week deal a crippling blow not only to the military in Turkey, but also to that old secularist order? For decades, the Turkish army has guaranteed a separation of church and state in Turkey. It also plays a major economic role in the country as a shareholder in companies and banks. This was the fifth time the military has intervened since the Republic was founded in 1923. The army always stepped in when its leaders decided the state doctrine of Kemalism was in danger. The four earlier coups succeeded. There have been worries another could happen ever since Erdogan's AKP party assumed power in November of 2002. And the party feared it too. Many top figures in the army have already been replaced over the years and hundreds of other military figures arrested. The latest coup attempt failed. Is the power of the Turkish army now broken for good? What do you think, Sera Sera? Is that power now broken for good? Is the army no longer in the role that it has so long been seen in in Turkey? Well, first we have to understand the people that attempted this coup, it would be wrong to characterize it as the Turkish army because this is different than the other coups that Turkey has lived. So it was a small group of people within the army. So it is really um, dangerous to say the Turkish army was responsible for this. And um, But having said that, um, of course, with, uh, with the AKP government, the role of the army has it had started slowly changing, uh, complying with the EU regulations, trying to bring a, trying to make Turkey more democratic. The role of army did change over the years. And now, at least with this now uh, state of emergency, the governors of Turkey 
right now are going to decide what the army is going to do. So we're going to see after um, the emergency of state is over, how the, the army is going to be functioning. If it's going to still be uh, functioning as it used to, or is it going to be connected with the uh, Defense Department and all those uh, changes, we still um, do not know. So, Antje Bauer, our report uh, essentially posed the question, are we seeing the end not only of Kemalism, of that secularist Republican model which Ataturk introduced, but also the end of Erdogan's phase of democracy? Um, I think Erdogan's phase of democracy has finished. I agree to you that in the beginning of when he started governing, um, he was introducing a sort of democracy that was not known in Turkey. Um, he gave a voice to all these, all these Muslim parts of the population which did not agree to the secular elite, which was mainly sitting in the west of the country and saw themselves more than Europeans and uh, looked down to all these poor Anatolian people who were Muslims. Um, in the beginning, I personally sympathized with uh, Erdogan. But uh, this has changed some years ago, and uh, he's, he's started being more and more autocratic. And so I think uh, the democratic phase of what he, what he did has finished, let's say, about three years ago, four years ago. And uh, he's going more and more like a dictator. And I think this is, this is the good opportunity now to do whatever he wants, take over the power where he hadn't had it until now. So that would take us back to the blank check idea. Alan Posner, where do you think the blank check could lead? Would you expect Turkey to become an outright Islamist republic? Well, that's the question, isn't it? <laughs> um, if so, uh, he's, done the, he's attacking the wrong people because the Gulen movement, who he's accusing of being behind this plot, are conservative uh, is uh, uh, Muslims, and they have infiltrated, there's no doubt about that, large parts of the state. So if you wanted to establish an Islamic Republic, surely you would use them. If you use, as he's doing now, the state against Gulen, then surely he's undermining any hope he might have of establishing an Islamist Republic. It boils down then to the sort of authoritarian uh, sort of semi-dictatorship that Turkey has known so often, and he will be more dependent, I mean, Mr. Erdogan, more dependent on the military than if he had been together with Mr. Gulen. So it's very... Mm -hmm. It's an unclear situation uh, as far as uh, Islam is concerned. Let's just recall um, the movement that Alan Posner has just mentioned, namely the uh, movement established by the Islamist cleric Fethullah Gulen. His followers have set up an international network of schools that the Turkish president now claims is associated with the coup attempt, and he blames Gulen pers personally for the attempt. Interestingly enough, the two men were once allies. <laughs> Now, Mr. Erdogan is seeking extradition of Mr. Gulen from the United States, where he had taken up residence some years ago, with Mr. Erdogan saying that Mr. Gulen's organization has infiltrated not only schools, but many other institutions in Turkey as well. Seda Seda, how far do you think that President Erdogan is likely to go to try to root out this conspiracy, as he calls it, and how far do you think that the Gulen movement actually reaches? <laughs> That's a tough question for anyone to answer, um, but experts that have been researching the Gulen movement for years, they are also clear that this was um, an attempt made by the Gulen movement. And when we're just talking about, you know, um, Turkey becoming more Islamic and if Gulen movement should actually be a partner in this, well, they were a partner. That's how they got rid of the, the secular um, um, generals that were in jail for so many years that are now out because Ergenekon doesn't apparently exist anymore, which was a trial that was used to basically get rid of the secular um, generals. Um, so it's really hard to say how deep Gulen was involved, but um, it is not 
a conspiracy theory that it exists. Antje Bauer, um, the uh, United States government says it has received documents from Turkey that apparently purport to include evidence that Gulen was involved. What's your take on all of this? Um, do you think he is absolutely behind what we saw last week? And if so, should he be extradited even if it winds up meaning he faces the death penalty? I think it's difficult to prove something like this. And um, I don't know if he's, again, if he's behind it. He, he denied. Um, I think what, what is uh, being played there is a power game. As you said before, they were once friends. And then they, they separated. And since then, Gulen is the, the outspoken enemy of Mr. Erdogan. And um, I think the, the point is that there's a, a mortal power play inside of the, of the system, of the Turkish system. And uh, in Turkey, they talk about a parallel state, mm -hmm. uh, which uh, the Gulenist movement has built up. And that's true. They built it up together, Erdogan's people and Gulen's people, as long as they liked each other. And now there's a power game if the Gulen people are still there or if uh, Erdogan uh, manages to put, to replace all these Gulen people by his own people. So I think, as you said, uh, that's not a question of ideology because both of, both of them uh, say they are moderate Islamists, Muslims, political Muslims, but uh, I, the, the difference is power play, I think. And so the question is not so much should he be, be extradited? Uh, what did he do exactly? Uh, it's more about what what is going on. Or how much uh, state will be will re, will remain because they politicized everything. That is the main problem, I think, because the the state of law is is uh, is getting zero. It was it's become less and less in the last years, and uh, they are eliminating what what remains. Now, interestingly enough, of course, uh, threats from Gulenists, threats from Putschists are by no means the only dangers that Turkey is facing at the moment. The government has resumed hostility with Kurdish militants in the southeast, and it is also facing attacks from Islamic State. The West has been depending on Turkey as a partner as it seeks to fight IS and contain the stream of migrants from the Middle East. Will Turkey remain a dependable partner? Incirlik Air Base plays a key role in NATO's ongoing military operations against IS. But now several Turkish officers there have been arrested, accused of taking part in the coup attempt. German MPs have also been denied access to German soldiers stationed at Incirlik. Is the country still a reliable partner in the alliance? Turkey is also considering the reintroduction of the death penalty. That's a red line for the EU. No country can become a EU member state if it introduces that penalty. That is very clear in our acquis, as we call it. Will this turn European sentiment against Turkey's bid for membership? But Erdogan is in a powerful bargaining position in the refugee crisis. Is Europe dependent on Turkey? Alan Posner, how concerned should the West be about a destabilized Turkey? And will all the various things now being said by Western leaders make any difference at all to Erdogan and how he behaves? We need to stabilize Turkey because it's the only stable state uh, except for uh, Israel in the region. It's an ally. It's a member of NATO. We heard it. We're totally dependent on them to keep order there. So, um, therefore, he has more influence on us than we have on him. Uh, of course, the, the fact that we're negotiating EU membership means that we can say, if, as, as we heard, you know, if you do this, then, then it, you, know, you won't get in the club. But does he care? I, he says he cares, and um, as long as, he's do as he doesn't break off the negotiations, we shouldn't. Sira Seda, one of the sad statements that uh, I've heard repeatedly from, uh, quoted from people in Turkey is that Turkey is now become a country, uh, becoming a country much like all the other countries in the region, unstable, autocratic. Do you think that's right? It is a very sad statement. Um, I believe it is going in that direction. But Turkey is different from the other countries in the region. But there is, of course, the danger for it to fall.
in that pit, if you will. So uh, Turkey has to be very careful. The EU has to be also very careful. I believe EU played its cards very wrong with the refugee deal. So they basically ignored everything that Turkey was doing against human rights and fundamental rights, and they focused on the refugee issue, which is number one for Europe. So what should the EU change right now? Um, they have us over a That's barrel. A million they have dollar the EU question. over a barrel, don't they? The fact is, the EU continues to rely on Turkey. Turkey has millions of refugees mm -hmm. within its country. If it were to open the gates, the flow starts again, doesn't it? It does, but EU has to be very careful. EU has to. I think the best thing EU can do right now is um, show support, and what they can do right now is uh, really. At the same time, while showing support, promoting democracy, but they should also be careful and watch exactly what's happening. Anja Bauer, would you agree that the West, in a sense, has given Turkey a blank check in the past? And if so, what kind of check should they issue now? How should they proceed? I think the influence of the West is very small right now. Because I think, in fact, everybody in Turkey now knows that there will no uh, EU membership in the middle term, even maybe not in the long term. I doubt that very much. And I think they are aware, aware of that, this. And I think the popularity of Europe has, has decreased very much in the last year. So I think the influence is very small. I, I agree to what, uh, what Seda said. Uh, uh, still, the EU, EU has to talk to them, has tried to ask them to respect the uh, state of law and all this. There's not much more we can do. And I think threatening Turkey, saying we are going to stop the negotiations, mm -hmm. I think that's a wrong move. And, and one thing is really important. We need to demand proof that actually uh, Gulen was behind this. Because mm -hmm. if it's it can, conceivable that Fethullah Gulen actually tried a coup against an elected government, then we have a problem in Europe because there's lots of Hulan schools and so on here uh, in Europe, as in Africa, as all over the place. We, this needs to be proved beyond a shadow of a doubt. And if it can't be proved, then uh, we need to demand the release of all these people who've been, um, who've been arrested. And if it can be proved, we need to look at what's going on in our own countries. So that's, that's you know, this, this is key. Is that a plausible scenario to you, that if the EU were to say, or the US, or both, hey, we've seen the evidence, we're not convinced, uh, we think you need to release those people, would it happen, uh, Seda Seda? Hmm. <laughs> I don't think that would happen. But you do think we should definitely look at the... Definitely, definitely. I believe evidence. it is, I believe the evidence should be open, it should be transparent. That is what EU should focus on, to, to understanding what's happening, who these people are, what are the criteria, are they getting a fair trial? That's, I think, I believe that is the key. And the government argues that they have the evidence, that they have sent it to the US. The US is saying that they haven't gotten an official demand yet, so it's a very tricky situation. Um, Gulen is living in Pennsylvania in his, some people call it a farm, but it's very well guarded location. Um, so it's a big topic. Anja Bauer, I mentioned the EU being over a barrel. The U.S. is very eager to continue to prosecute that war against IS. It uses Inchalik Air Base for the purpose. We saw it in the report. Its commanding officer is among those who has just been purged. So does the U.S. really have any interest to get tough in Turkey? With Turkey? Oh, not really, but the problem is there's an anti-American slogans right now in Turkey being voiced. Um, a high official of the government also said that uh, Injilik, the fact that the uh, fact that there were some leaders of Injilik base who were involved in the coup attempt, um, that, that that means that the Americans are behind it. I think the Americans don't have so much leverage either. But difficult. Maybe one more point to that: um, Turkey also needs NATO. We should not forget that. Turkey mm -hmm. is also fighting IS. Turkey has uh, PKK at its hand. So, and the so Kurdish, many, uh, the, the, the Kurdish rebels, or as Turks prefer to say, terrorist organization. Um, but at the same time, so we've seen all these generals that have been um, arrested. So Turkey really needs NATO as well. Could that help to moderate that blank check, uh, Ellen, and perhaps get some kind of negotiations going with Turkey? Well, I guess it could, but in the past, NATO hasn't really cared very much whether Turkey was a democracy or not. NATO has always 
uh, dealt with whoever was in power. Um, mm. Mostly it was generals and so on, now it's not generals or it's other generals. Um, I wish NATO would be very tough on this because I fear the EU doesn't have the negotiating power, we've heard it. Um, so yes, I, I, I wish NATO would do that. Many thanks to all of you for being with us on this look at the turmoil in Turkey. And thanks to all of you for tuning in. See you soon.